Okay, and welcome back again to Peaker's Advantage. Is this episode 10 now? I think this is episode 10. Peaker's Advantage, episode 10. We have a liege from Liquid here. A liege, welcome onto the show. I appreciate Hello, you welcome. being here with us. Same. I don't uh, think it's episode 10, but... I think it is. Good job, dude. I'm pretty sure it is. It yeah. is episode 10. Yeah. Okay. This is, You're this the host. I'm there you go. <laughs> Are you in charge, though? Well, not really. I uh, don't okay. <laughs> All right, so Elish, again, welcome to the show. Uh, why don't you tell us what is going on with you right now? Uh, just like the team? You, the player break, like what's going on in your life right now? Uh, yeah, so we just got off the player break literally today. Today was the first day of practice. Everyone, like we've all just been doing our own thing on the player break. Been trying to just play at least an hour a day over the player break just so we don't lose all of our skill and come back super cold. And it went over pretty well today. I think everyone still has their aim pretty much on point. It feels good. That's good. Happy to hear it. Uh, have you? So you, today was your first day of scrims. Then how did it go? Um, I think it went pretty well. Like obviously, we we weren't like being super like try hard tactical just because. Well, one the like we're not playing against like MIBR and on C9 and NRG right now. So we were kind of just making sure that we're warmed up and. Making sure that our mechanics are on point and our communication is good. Do you have a boot camp coming up anytime soon? Yeah, we're leaving in five days for the Netherlands, and we're going to be boot camping from then until the major. That's oh, not. Well, damn, must be nice, huh, Corey? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> must be nice to get boot camps. So I saw uh, Corey was uh, deadlifting 600 pounds on Instagram. 585. Wait, what's your max? Uh, I did 675 a couple months ago. <laughs> for like 10. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, for one. <laughs> but that's when I would wait a little bit more. So it's just like, you know, get the fat power. It's very, 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 very powerful. It's okay, though. Now you're dieting. Right? Yeah. 3,500 calories. No, you were looking <laughs> yeah. hella slim, dude. I saw your Instagram post. You're down to like, what, 235? Yeah, I was 237. And funny thing, so... Over two days, I decided to carb up. I went from 237 to 251 in two days. <laughs> so, <laughs> just from water. You. you look yeah. pretty big, John. You been working out or what? Yeah, ever since that I moved to LA, I have been. So, past four months. Like five days a week or? Uh, three to four days a week. Nice. So Everyone's what's your setup like in LA? Like, how do you, like, are you inside of a, like, what, what's the setup there for you? Uh, so I'm in an apartment and about like a 20 to 25 minute walk. There's a gym, and I j we just I just walk there. There you go. It's pretty dope. Yeah. Do you do you have like an opinion on whether you like prefer living at home or living in a gaming house? What do you think? I've personally never lived in a gaming house, but I'd never really wanted to because for me privacy is like a really big thing, and I never wanted to move here if I didn't have at least my own room. Do you have oh, a bunch well, of shady I... shit, dude? What, what's going on in your <laughs> in your house? <laughs> no, then no, I just I, don't, I, don't I like just really <laughs> value my privacy with that type of stuff. So uh, I I don't think that I could personally do a gaming house. Yeah. So besides Astralis, who do you think is the hardest team for you to play against? Besides Astralis, um, Astralis. I th yeah, I think <laughs> I think Phase or Mouse Sports. I guess maybe. Yeah. I guess mouse sports a little bit more. I think they're just really solid and they play really structured CS. Oscar's super scary. Sunny's been a monster. So I think they're just a super good team in general. So in in your opinion, from playing against them, what makes mouse sports different to phase? Like how, how do they play differently? What makes mouse sports harder to play against? I think mouse sports does more things that are more tactical and safe. I think they're a more safe team than phase is. And phase is a team that is going to use their aim and use their skill against you. And and I think that Kerrigan is just a really good leader, too. And he's able to call really different things like constantly. Like The whole pace of the game can just change. OK. Well, we had this conversation the last podcast. Um, what would you think, or what do you think your team needs to beat Astralis on a consistent basis? Because like, I think you guys have the players to beat them, but obviously they've beat you in three finals now, right? Yeah. So obviously they're like the one team that you guys struggle with to a point. Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, I think one of the main issues is the way that we were preparing for it. I mean, if you look at our schedule for all those three tournaments that we lost to them, they were all right in a row, essentially. And Astralis wasn't doing that. They were practicing in between. They were working on things that they need to work on, fixing things. And we don't really get that same thing when we are going to tournaments constantly. And I personally don't really like that. This It's been mm -hmm. like... I think this is the third time that I've had like four to five weeks of tournaments straight in a row. And I think it's super bad. Like every time I think it's super bad, it never works out. Because if you have things to work on and you're not Astralis, then like, I'm not saying that they don't have things to work on, but we have more things to work on. We don't have the time to do that. And I think that uh, during those tournaments, we haven't been able to fix those problems to make a real difference in the next encounter. I mean, we kind of been losing the same exact way every single time. So mm -hmm. that's how I feel about it. Some more time, essentially, would help? Not not just time. It's it's not about just, like... It's a better prep, right? Yeah, better prep in general. Like, it's a way different thing when you're at a boot camp where you're, you're back here where we're just practicing normally and we can actually focus on certain things. It, it's a completely different environment when you're just, like, scrambling to find practice, like, for two yeah. or three scrims at a tournament. Especially when you can't even play with some of the good teams. Like in Atlanta right now, uh, the last tournament that we were at, there was no teams to play, especially because of the player break that was happening. There was no teams that were playing. We didn't want to play some of the teams that were in the other group because we potentially could have faced them after playoffs. And the teams that were out, they're going home. So that's just like one example of a tournament where it's really difficult. Do you think have that, you? Um... Okay, go ahead, Corey. Do you think that they that you guys have a problem because, like, statistically, Device is their best player and he's their opper, and uh, your riflers are all your best players, and Nitro is kind of like dual wielding the op slash calling role. So I feel like Device gets a lot of free kills on you guys when, especially maps like Inferno and stuff, where it's just he kind of just has free roam, you know? Like he doesn't really have someone that is like Guardian who's like dedicated to just killing him. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that's like a big reason that you lose, or do you think that's not as big of a deal? I personally don't think it's as big of a deal. The only maps where I actually feel felt super destroyed by Astralis was Nuke, and and the times where we lost on Inferno, I think that our team play was just super bad. Like I'm actually remembering a couple of rounds where we're just trying to retake Banana on Inferno, and he's at the broken wall, and he's just constantly repeating, repeating, repeating because we're not using the proper flashes, we're not going with the flashes when we're supposed to, and I think that's a result of uh, either bad prep, not like not practicing enough, like not knowing what exactly you should be doing, and so when the pressure's on and you don't have those super refined habits that you're used to in practice that you don't even need to think about, that is when like it all comes down to it. And I don't think that we had it, and so I don't really think that having a super deady op has been the reason why we've been losing. But yeah, just my opinion. Speaking of that, though, like. Yeah, I, don't know. I was just talking about, like, I guess I'll add on to what Corey said. So, like, speaking of Nitro, for example, you guys before that had JDM. Would you say this is the best iteration of Liquid? I think it's the best iteration of our team, for sure. Yeah, I, I think that, especially outside of the game, I think we're all super chill with each other. I think our roles feel really good. I think we're all super confident in every single player. So, yeah, for sure. So, so like, my second question of that was, like, okay, so obviously your main op before Nitro was JDM. So, like, What's the difference between someone like JDM and someone like, like, what does Nick bring that JDM didn't? Let's just take the calling out of it. Honestly, that's a super hard question because Nick is really doing the same types of stuff because before, well, speaking of the last roles that Nick was doing was support when Josh was on the team. Yeah. So for me, it's really hard to think of like a specific difference because when you're an op and you're taking mid control on a lot of maps, like thinking of Mirage specifically, you're going to be either holding the angle for the connector guy to re-peek you, or you're going to be flashing for your teammates doing something. All right. So it's, it's kind of hard for me to think about it because Nick is just doing the same role he's always been. And then on some of the maps, it's the other person that's been inserted into Josh's role, where it's the difference okay. where it's a rifler. So it's gotcha. kind of hard to give a comparison of the one on one for them. Gotcha. Was there like problems between like you guys outside of the game, really, like on your previous iterations of the team, as opposed to like right now? Because you said right now everyone's like super chill. On yeah, the team. I think like every iteration we've had some type of problem outside of the game. Not not thinking of like 2015 or. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Every other roster besides that, usually, yeah. 
myself so, included. I guess going, going, going. Or do you want to say something, Davy? I was just gonna Keep ask, to like, um, why, like, what made it not work out with Simple? Like, like more, like everyone knows the, everyone's heard some of the stories about how he, him being toxic in the past, especially when he was younger. But like, what do you think specifically made it not work out with him in the team? Um, I think that he was just super, um, like the way that he gave criticism wasn't really the best way to give it to people. And, um, he, he went super hard on people usually. And I personally didn't like seeing that. And if, uh, and I didn't deal with it very well either because I was still maturing. Uh, so I think that's some of the main reasons why without going too in-depth for it. Nice. Okay. So in terms of prep, um, what's sort of the dynamic between Zeus and, and Nitro? Because I've, I've heard a, a bunch of stories about Zeus, but I, I've, I always like have to make assumptions. So I'm, I'm not too sure about how it is. Uh, Zeus, usually like when we're doing practice, he'll have things that he's seen like other teams been doing or things that we need to work on. Um, I, I actually don't think that we've been the most efficient this uh, this year with our practice, and I've had like so many ideas like before we went on to break for things that we could be implementing to have more efficient practice. And mm -hmm. usually Nick during tournaments is the one that is looking at demos and going to be giving us some types of things that uh, that the other team is going to be doing, like just not not like super anti-strat things, but just tendencies. Okay. So how involved is Zeus in the tactics? Because like there's some um, people that are like like because I I've heard just to elaborate a little bit I've heard different things where some people think he's more of like a a, pl a player like a an, an um, like a, an emotional coach like a player's management coach or um that and that he's not super involved in the tactics but like how involved is he? Are, are you talking more? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, do you mean more in practice or yeah. do you mean more in tournaments? In practice. In practice. Um, in practice, it's more of um, like the psychological thing, uh, dealing with things, writing down like what we need to fix. Uh, like I said before, he's going to be uh, like before practice, we usually have like an hour of going over stuff that we need to fix on or new things that we want to implement. And that's usually going to be coming from Zeus. And during the practice, he's just writing down stuff that we need to go over for the next day. Or he'll like make a comment if someone's not like saying something fast enough. Usually that type of stuff just to help out. Okay, so now moving for, moving changing topics, moving a little bit forward. As we're recording this, the CS:GO update just dropped with the MP5, and I've watched some videos of it, and it looks just kind of like it doesn't look. It just looks like an MP7, but with a silencer on it. Do you guys think that there's that? So to elaborate to go a little bit farther, do you guys think that Valve adding new guns and messing around with this is going to be beneficial for the game going forward, or not? I just keep, I hope they keep adding silencers to everything. I want a silent CZ, <laughs> I want, you know, silent scout, I want to, I want to never know. You just always be able to put a silencer <laughs> on everything. Yeah. So you never know I what gun never somebody know. has. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? I don't think it does anything. Yeah, I don't think it does anything. Unless they add an operation. I mean, it's good for the casual community to add, yeah. like, a new weapon. Well, it's not even available in Operation right now, here right? or there. It's a leader. Yeah, you can't use it, even in, like, scrims. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's only in, like, the in the casual. Will they use it for the major? Did they say? I don't know. It wasn't said at all. Okay. It probably will they be, but... They don't have the sickest comms. I don't think it will be. Because it took a super long time for the Negev and the Deagle... Or, not Deagle, Revolver, when they did those reworks, to even be allowed and competitive again. So I really doubt it when it's only two weeks away. Could you imagine if you could just like put a silencer on like anything? Like just like a silenced <laughs> op, a silenced AK. But I like, don't it just, it just that, like bro. takes damage away though. Like it takes a little bit of damage away, you know? But like you could yep. just silence everything. Silence that mole you don't know you're burning. It's you know, just <clears throat> I mean, no, okay. I, I was looking at the stats of the MP5, and like, you know, they got all the damage and everything. It's pretty similar to the MP7, but how much you guys want to bet this thing's completely accurate in the air? Like, you're just going to be able to jump around just murdering people, because... Like every other gun in this well, game. Didn't the, <laughs> well, the, the stat thing said that 
it was the same as the MP7, other than a few other things. Like the running accurate. Yeah, Actually, it's probably less yeah. accurate, right? I running accuracy. No, it, it's, it's more accurate. Yeah. No, it's accurate? less accurate when moving. Okay, less accurate. Less accurate. Okay. Really? I saw videos of guys running around shooting it, while, and it looks just dead accurate. Like, it looks super fucking accurate. But if you think about it, that's how, like, all of the SMGs no, all are. Like that. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's just like an MP, it's just like a Mac 10 but with a silencer on it, really. I think SMG of choice things. for everybody right now is an MP9. Yeah. I think MP9 is point. by far and away the best one. Yeah. yeah. It just it shoots the fastest. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there's actually one, there's one topic I wanted to touch on, and I think since you picked up NAF, it's a good topic. It's not, I don't think it's anything that's been discussed before, but um, what's sort of your opinion on giving players a second chance? Because you know how all of us have either experienced it or done it in a way, I'm sure, where you someone gets kicked from a team or someone leaves a team and they shit talk another team or teammate. Maybe they over-exaggerate. Of, mm -hmm. about how that player is as a person which yeah. usually is the case so um i guess sort of how did like picking up naf happen because naf is someone where there's always been conflicting reports about how his attitude is all that um well for me i never played with naf i was the one that yeah. came in for naf but just like based off how nick was for it i mean he didn't act like any different like he, he just when we were discussing it it just seemed, seemed like any other player and I think it's really important that you said before about like how players, when they leave teams, they just start saying all the shit that they can. I think that's a super horrible way to go about it, and it's a good thing Naf never did that, because I'm sure if he did, it probably still would be in someone's mind. Like For me personally, I probably would not want to play with a player that has just, after he left or got kicked, just went off and spread all the dirty laundry that he could, because obviously there's two sides to every story. It's not as drastic as the person like saying it is. It's never like that, and yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important thing. Like, if you're a player on a team right now and you get kicked, I really recommend not doing that if you ever want well, to get a second chance. It, yeah, it always gets back to the person, because any, yeah. any, pretty much any person I've kicked in the past has always, I've heard the stories, it's like, you should hear the shit he's saying about you right now, and I'm just like, oh. I mean, I didn't expect anything less than that. It stays in your that. head forever. Like, there's no point because it stays in the person's head forever. Like, but it's no... worse yeah. when you see them in person and then it's, like, all friendly. It's like, oh. Yeah. Like, yeah. you just bad -mouth me to four new teammates who could potentially be my teammates in the future. And then yeah. they may make an assumption about me that's not true. So, yeah. Also, I guess sometimes things are true and it'd be like, oh, this guy's, like, super toxic and it is true. Um, I guess how... How do you determine if someone's changed? Because, like, obviously people can change. Second chances aren't really given that often. I think Nav's probably the first example of someone that was cut from Liquid. Yeah, you replaced, we replaced you or Nav with you. And then now Nav's back on Liquid. I think that's the first time that's happened. So I guess, like, how, how you sort of sift through the bullshit and, like, make your own judgment. Honestly, that's a super hard question. I think that's <laughs> yeah, definitely a, a case by case thing. Uh, I, I think it's just more if you think that person has the capability to change. And I think everybody has the capability of changing. Like, I think I've completely changed from even myself right now to last year. I think a completely different teammate. And if you ask any of my teammates right now, I guarantee that they'd say the same too. What, what part of well, you do you think has changed exactly? Like, specifically speaking? Like, how did you used to be and you could, like, notice a drastic change between how you were a year ago? And how you are now? Uh, just like my mental game, just 100% all of my mental game. Okay. Uh, we've been working with a uh, sports psychologist named Jared Tendler, and he has been doing an insane job. And he talks about like your A game, your B game, and C game. C game is when you're playing horrible. B game is when you're playing average. And A game is when you're playing really good. And he talked about how if you want to get better, you have to improve on all aspects of your game. You can't just only be focusing on your A game. Because if you're always focusing on your A-game, you're going to be one of those players that has super high highs and super low lows. So you have to always be working on your C-game as well. So when you are having one of those bad days, things aren't going right. Let's just say that you woke up and it's just a bad day. You can't just like punish your teammates and just be playing like complete shit. Yeah. So that's like uh, something that I super worked on with my C-game. My comms are super good. I don't think I ever get super out of it tilted like I used to. And I, I definitely have been, like, just completely shut down. It's no news to anyone. 
and that never happens anymore. If it ever, like, literally maybe one game per, like, in eight months or something where it's just like, holy shit, like, everything's going bad, and it's not even close to the same magnitude, and I think that's the biggest difference when you actually work on the worst part of your games. Because right. everyone wants to be working on, like, having the super high highs and making insane plays, but if you're not working on the worst things of, of, like, yourself as a player, and mental game is included in that, too, and I think that's something that people don't really work on. So yeah. this year, we've been working a lot more with our sports psychologist. I've been doing a lot more reading, and I think that's super helped me as well. And just listening to people that are way more successful than me outside of CS, just in general, just super successful people and seeing their outlooks on everything has really changed, like, my life a lot. Well, you're a lot so, older now too, right? Like I'm 22 now. I wouldn't even like recognize the 19 year old version of myself. I'm a completely different person. Like you're just you, even like uh, how old are you now? 21. 21, yeah. Like you're like uh, the difference between a 21 year old and a 19 year old is so huge. Like in especially if you're actively trying to make it different. Like you mm. can be you can become a totally different person. You could be a way better person than you were two years ago. Or a year ago, and that's something that people don't don't really think about, like just like how how young a lot of players are. Like if you're 18 yeah. years old, you're you're just a kid, you know. Like you you're you're gonna make mistakes. People like Naf when he was, but you know, getting when he got kicked from Liquid the first time. How old was he? 17, maybe 17. 16. Like, or 16, yeah. Like you know, it's just a, it's a totally different person now. Like he's a completely different person than he was back then. I mean, maybe for Naf, not <laughs> not so. He's Naf. I mean, like Naf, as but... as a person, he's pretty similar but yeah. in terms of being a teammate right, and work exactly. ethic he's completely different like he, than yeah. he used to be but you, he didn't even used to play cs when he was on liquid yeah he did like five yeah. hours before a tournament <laughs> so i feel like russ yeah. i mean You're speaking to major, russ right? now i feel like he grew a lot too it's the same thing with russ like i knew him as a teammate and then now see talking to him now is a completely different person than he was yeah, well, he was fu he was fucking sixteen when he was playing on TSM. Like, no, Jesus I know. Christ, he's just yeah. a child for fuck's sakes. Yeah. So, Liege, if you were at like a major, and you're playing in like the semifinals or something, where it's like there's still pressure, but it's not insane yet, um, and you only sleep like three hours, so you feel like your aim is just shit. You know, like maybe you're nervous, or whatever. Maybe you just can't sleep. So your A game's off. Or do you naturally just try to play smarter, like in the sense of like? You hold more conservative angles on CT. You kind of maybe save your nades a bit longer than you normally would, or something like that. Just kind of give yourself more of a like a chance to maybe kill people, come through smokes, or like angle off because you're naturally you're like an aimer, right? You try to yeah. use your aim more than um, positioning. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me personally, I would be trying to do all the things that I'm used to, like with my habits, because. For me, I don't think that I play the best when I am playing super conservatively. And in those games where I am, that's when I can recognize in my mental that I need to start being more proactive. And that's when I do like some type of different push. But um, I think if you're a player that's more passive and you see yourself in a game and you're a little bit tilted or you're not, you don't have the best conditions to play with, and you, you, like, I think the most important thing is when you're playing bad, it's more important for you to recognize that you're playing bad, or if you're tilted, it's super important for you to recognize that you're tilted. And I think that's the first step. And the next step is, how do you get out of being tilted? And I think that's what you would have to be working on the most as a player. But in terms of just sleep, I think that sleep is really important. I think if you're getting less than six hours, eight hours minimum, you're gonna be playing worse than you usually do because you just don't have the energy. It's a mental focus game, right? So like, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of personally, for me, I feel like I want to get eight hours, but like if you get six hours here or there, it's okay. But, you know, um, yeah. consistently six, you're going to eventually perform worse, I think. And I think that's the thing that a lot of the younger players don't take into consideration is their sleep. Like, I think a lot of older players have kind of been around a while or, you know, something like you've been to a million events. You're probably uh, going to prioritize going to sleep a little bit earlier. Yeah. Than, um, some people who stay on their phones to like 4 a.m. or something. Yeah. Well, that, sure. that's one thing where I noticed with our team that, uh, you know, it, you, you can you, some people manage jet lag better than others, but I noticed that sleep 100% matters because every event we've went to where we played the early match, so Star Ladder, we played two later matches. We lost a Liquid and lost a North, which were both later in the day or later-ish in the day, but then the rest of the tournament we played at 10 a.m. every day. 
so we were all super jet lagged. We, we were all waking up at like 3, 4 a.m., you know? So when it came to the final, we woke up and we played our match at like 11 or 12 uh, in the morning. But then we played Navi at like 7 or 8 p.m. And that's usually when we were going to bed. I'm not making excuses. They're an insane team. But then the next event, even Shanghai. So Shanghai, we won it. Every match was early. Even the matches for the playoffs, it was all like 11, 12, uh, like 11 a.m. and 12 in the afternoon. And the minor, I'm not making excuses again, but like the minor, all the matches were late. It was like the earliest match we played was like 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. And that was all kind of like on the same trip, right? Like we went to four lands in a row before the minor. The minor was like the fifth land in a row. And then Shanghai was like a while after that. So I think sleep 100% matters because I, I think, see it within our own team. Yeah, I think like for me <clears throat> for me and some of my other teams um, that I've tried to like – certain players, I try to force them to stay up and stuff because I know like they're going to land at 11 a.m. and just go to bed and wake up at like 9 p.m. and that's bad you know like I, I think a lot of people got to stop taking naps because they just turn into like 12 hour sleeps on jet lag and like you you're just gonna wake up at 3 a.m. like you guys said like it's hard not to sometimes but like even if you can kind of plan your sleep the day before you leave or something like it's not always possible but I don't know I I personally think it's better to stay up as late as you can the day that you land um and then try just to don't wake go to up. your room. Just get yeah. out of your yeah. room. Yeah, no, seriously, don't even like fucking seriously go stay walk around. Room. Like, have a shower first, maybe, and then just like nice cold leave. shower. <laughs> What's well, good now? Because every tournament now is like giving practice rooms to teams, so it's like you could just go do that. And I think that's super important because a lot of teams, like last year, there was like none in my opinion, or maybe the year before, I can't remember. But there's a lot more practice rooms. I think every tournament that's over 100k or 150k has that. So. Like only E-League had them, right? For a while there. Like, yeah, it was bit, only yeah. E-League, and now it's every Star single... Ladder has it. Every single event, like, yeah. starting this year has had it. And it's all been in, like, the hotel, too, which has been amazing. Yeah, like every hotel event rooms? does the hotel rooms now. Because yeah, then you're just not bored, right? Like, part, part of the reason it's hard to stay up sometimes is because, like, you're on your phone in your room for yeah. six hours. Like, like you're going to fall asleep, like... Yeah. You can go even play PUBG. Like I know some people talk shit, but like when you're when you're tired as hell, you don't want to like be DMing sometimes. Like you rather just like have fun for a bit and then practice in the morning. Like people get really like strung up on like when a pro plays a different game for like an hour. Do you it's guys true. think uh, VP is going to improve significantly now with this new with this new uh, roster change, or do you think that they're still going to be kind of where they are now? I think they'll improve. For sure. Well, no, no, definitely no, improve no, 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 significantly. Like, do you think now they're going to start not. high placing? Do you, or do you think it, they're still just going to stick, stay around where they are? Oh, like quarterfinal, semifinal runs? Yeah, no, like, I don't like think start, so. You know, like start becoming a team that can, you know, actually. Not for a while, I don't think. Definitely not for a while, but I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they only replaced one player. You know, it's not going to make that big of a difference. Um, the only way that usually happens is if that player that they did they ended up replacing is like was a really, really big problem, which I don't really know the inner workings of their team, but Statue is definitely a good player, and it's definitely going to improve a little bit for them. Okay. I mean, we'll on the we'll players, see it's right? Zotac. Like, like yeah. if they all want it more, right? Like, maybe it... Oh, yeah, it could be a some, motivation uh, thing for the yeah. team. Because yeah. it does feel like, even when they're losing, they, they probably weren't super motivated, you know? There's probably something yeah. happening. And, and they've replaced two players now, John, not, not just one. They've Snacks and Taz. Oh, yeah, that's right. I keep forgetting about Snacks. Yeah. He go. He's over at Mouse Sports now. John, do you think Snacks makes Mouse Sports better, or do you think they were better with Stiko? As a team. Uh, me? Yeah, yeah. Me? Which John? Okay, sorry, geez, you got, you're, right, you're saying John you're right, you're right, you're right. That was my bad. That was a mistake on my part. I did it without <laughs> really thinking about it. Elige, do you think Mouse Sports is better, was better with Stiko, or do you think now they're scarier with Snacks? Um, honestly, it's too hard to tell. Because we've only saw the one event where they didn't really have that much practice, and I think it takes a long time for uh, a huge structural change for that to go through. Because it's not that they just picked up a better Stiko; they they picked up a, a completely different player, and they're going to have to accommodate their whole team structure for that type of change. And we're going to see if they're able to get like make it work. So it's all up to them, really. And I think that they can make it work. I mean, they're all really good players, and I, I think that they have the capability, too. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think they have the right mixture of experience and skill on the team. It just depends on... I think Viali's the main person it depends on. Because he used to, Going back to VP be now. ridiculously... Yeah, okay. on Virtus Pro. Like, I think it really depends on Virtus Pro. Or if not Virtus Pro, Viali <laughs> on Virtus Pro. For them to, like, step up. Because Mishu's been pretty consistent. I don't think Snatchy will have a problem playing well. Nio's calling... And Posh has been one of their best players, hasn't he? Yeah, he's been, playing really Posh well. has been playing really well. And the other thing I've noticed too is it seems like now with the new players they've brought in, it seems like Neo almost has more control over the team now. Like, because when if you're in game leading, like when he was, even if he was in game leading before, the team sort of always played the same way. We've been watching recently; they've been almost a different team now. Like the way they're playing is totally, it's not totally different, but the way they're playing now is a lot different to the way they were playing before. And it, it looks like th he's actually having more of an influence as an in-game leader now than he was previously. Yeah. So if he can get that sorted out, because he's the GOAT, and if he can just get that sorted out, and I feel like that team can actually be a lot better than they are right now. But the way I feel about uh, the VP is the exact same way I feel about Nip. It's like, I just don't know. It just depends on what players, like what team shows up, like the really good Nip or the mediocre one. Yeah. I feel like they're both very, very similar positions right now, to be honest. Well, with Nip... I feel like that's North as well. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of teams. Because North just got rid of their opera, so now... What, what led uh, to your guys' consistency then, Nalish? Because I feel like Liquid was never as consistent on the international stage as you guys are right now, which is probably why you said this is probably the best iteration. What mm -hmm. do you guys think makes that happen? Like, Do you think it's just like the individual players are more consistent? Or is it like a combination of things? Um, I, I think the, well, first of all, I think that we're all really good players, not to say that people before us weren't, but I yeah, think yeah. that we're all ex like really, really good right now. And like I said before, with working on our C game type stuff, like really honing in on the stuff that we do really bad. Like if someone's communicating bad and just having the freedom to call that out and have him take that well and be like, yeah, I really need to work on that. I think that's been one of the main things things that has changed our team for the better because we were the type of teams where we would have really good games against like SK or C9 and then we just lose to a team that we should never lose to and I, I think that's one of those things on expectations which was a really big thing that Jared has said to us is uh, like for example if you're going to die to someone and you're just going to complain as the first thing you said like oh what's that guy doing like jumping like a smoke through an idiot yeah. like you shouldn't be like comment like that or even thinking like that because obviously it killed you, and next time you should be prepared for it. So you shouldn't expect like, that you are going to be killing that guy if you're not prepared for it. And just in general, I think that's been a really big issue for us that we've worked on and improved on. Gotcha. That was my favorite part about playing on Liquid. Anytime <laughs> someone died, I'd be like, what is this idiot doing? <laughs> What's he doing, man? <laughs> That's pretty standard fun. across the board on most teams, I think. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I think that's everybody just, all, that's what, just what everybody does. Everybody, especially everybody in FPL. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. yeah, no, especially in FPL. In FPL, it's warranted, though. No, honestly. So like, what bad. are these no, guys is. doing? It's... No, it is, but it's like everyone does it now. It's like even yeah. the players that literally just the got The players that are, what are they doing? It's <laughs> funny. Um, the it... other... The... What are you gonna say, Dave? Uh, nothing. I was just gonna complain about FPL more, but I probably shouldn't. Go ahead. Uh, the <laughs> the other topic I want to talk about, just because Elise is on the show, is because you were like valedictorian in your school, right, or something? Or you're like pretty yeah, smart. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> All actually right. So I wanted to talk about pros after CS:GO and sort of like, because when that whole player union was being created, and I talked to Sir Scoots, I brought up that like, the player union should help players have like a sort of a career path after CS because from my experience with playing with teammates and stuff a lot of them haven't some of them haven't even finished high school some of them haven't went to a lot of them haven't went to university or college and some of them don't even know what they would do if CSGO stopped so I guess what's your opinion on like the player union and what they should do to help players in a way it's sort of an open question yeah I mean I think that's obviously a really good idea, and I'm sure like down the road, maybe like 10 years, that could be a type of thing that could be established. But I think, I mean, obviously right now the Players Association is not even 
uh, like super well established. Obviously, we're announced and we set everything for it right now, but there hasn't been anything major that's come from it. And I think that the first uh, objectives is having like the clear communication with Valve and working on the things that we like that are super top priority. I think that uh, career paths outside, like as soon as you're done with CSGO, I think that's an important topic for the lives of players, but it's not really an important thing for like the scene, like as a CSGO scene, because in the end it is kind of like your life that you have to be thinking about constantly, like what is the best thing that you need to be doing for yourself? What's the thing that you should be working on? Is CSGO the best thing for me right now? Like what should I be doing afterwards? I think those are all questions that only you are going to be able to answer. And I think only something that is really well established many years down the road would be able to help with something like that. Well, a big a big part of the question is like, a lot of people aren't even educated in like sort of what they would do. Because let's say for your example, you said this is something that would be established in 10 years. So obviously people that are like star players will probably play till the game dies, right? Yep. So while they're a star player and playing till the game dies, you also... Like, as you play, you're taking the opportunity to be a pro player, but you also lose opportunities the older you get. So it's like, if I play from 20 years old to 30 years old, and I have no education when I hit 30, um, and so a lot of jobs, you don't even need education. If you play in esports for 12 years, you probably get a job in esports, but if those people don't even have basic understanding of, like, what a normal job is, um, and some players are even really privileged as well. Some players don't even know what it's like for like a boss to tell them like to show up on time and like the consequences of like doing things incorrectly so i think that's sort of why it's important because uh even i saw some articles about how some football players like leave the nfl earlier than they even need to because some of them say that they're they're missing opportunities that they wouldn't have down the road so I think yeah. that's why it's I think that's why it's an important thing to like at least someone even if it's just it doesn't even need to be the player union like the organizations but then I guess why would the orgs tell the players like about opportunities outside of being a pro for them? Well, so, uh, it's it's honestly super hard because it really is all going to be so dependent on the player. Like maybe you think that you're towards the end of your career. And you have a really good relationship with the org. Like, I have a really good relationship with Team Liquid, and I, I'm i thinking about retiring, and I'm going to start asking, hey, do you think that I'd have a place here after I'm done playing? Is there anything that my skill set or anything that I could learn to do? Because I, I think I'd be able to learn it. Is there anything that I'd be able to do? Or maybe if I like college, maybe I start taking an online course, maybe just a, a couple credits just online, and you can start doing that at any time you wanted to. If you were actually super dedicated and you knew that's what you wanted to do, then maybe just take... It only takes a couple hours a day, honestly, maybe two or three hours to really do one or two classes online. So mm-hmm. I, I, it's a really good point, but I don't really know like how an org or an association could help yeah, I have no with idea. the future of players. All right, I'll, I'll do it. Okay, here it is, guys. All new up-and-coming players, signing contracts, current players, whatever. Don't spend all of your paycheck when you get it. First of all, make sure you save money for taxes because you got to pay those. You don't have a choice. Those suck. You got to pay them. Then, out of whatever percentage you have left, put some of your money away. Don't spend it all. Don't be super happy that you got a paycheck and spend it all. Don't live paycheck to paycheck if you're getting good money. That's stupid. I can't tell you how many people I know, players included, that if they're like, okay, let's just say, for example, we're getting paid $5,000 this month. Okay, how... Can I? How many different ways can I spend all five thousand of these dollars this month? <laughs> how can I make sure that I am living at the exact maximum amount that I possibly can? Don't do that. Pre- always be preparing for your own future. Always try to be look looking ahead to what could possibly be next and prepare for that. That's all yep. you can do. That's it. Yeah, I mean, because saving money you can't is rely on, a huge thing. You can't rely on. A players association or an organization or anything like that to be taking care of you in the future it's just not gonna i just work gamble like that, that shit usually well, <laughs> I, well if you win that's great <laughs> <laughs> and you're a winner you know you, you could you could go I, b- I believe in you Corey. i don't believe in all the other guys <laughs> kids, okay i mean Corey just says fitness training to fall back on and like professional <laughs> bodybuilding and stuff so <laughs> Corey's got his career after set 
Well, he totally a lot of could be. He it. totally could be a personal trainer, though. Oh, hundred like, percent. So easily, if he wanted to. I gotta, I gotta ask Corey. Why don't you just stream and have like one of those people become your sponsor? I don't. Because right now you don't have an org, right? Because your team doesn't have an org. That's Might as well true. just stream. Yeah. You have no one else to represent but yourself. Screw just it. Just sponsored get sponsored by, uh... by like bodybuilding, fucking Gymshark. <laughs> I don't know anybody you want. I don't know if I fit in Gymshark clothing. But... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Small for you. But um. Speaking of streamers, though, so... dude, there are a lot of that's a lot of money to go around in streaming. It's like no, better for sure. I think not everyone can stream, right? It's like one of those things where some people are just like not entertaining, but. Yep. I think, you know, someone like Forrest, who's been a legend, he has no problem, I think, just switching to streaming, right? Like, he's going to get multiple thousands of views day yeah. one, streaming like, playing is, whatever. Streaming's tough, though. Like, it's not tough, like, obviously, you know, comparatively. Like, compared to fucking mining, it's not hard. But, like, being enter being on camera and for a long time, to be entertaining it's for an extended period of time is difficult unless you have that personality for it. Not everybody. I don't find it that it. hard for like an hour or two, but after you hit that third hour, it's yeah, like exactly. hard to like care. <laughs> yeah. No, I feel you yeah. completely. Like, I just don't enjoy it. Like if I stream for long periods of time or even like days back to back, I feel like there's no point in me doing it because I don't feel happy with the content I'm putting out at that point. And, and if I don't like the content I'm putting out, I can't imagine why somebody else would want to watch it. Yeah. No, it's definitely something you have to be passionate about and be decent at, at the least. Yeah, that's, that's why I think really... YouTube's better. If you, if you can't handle that, like, like, why don't you just like vlog your gym sessions, Corey, or do, do cause like a lot of, I, like, I don't watch workout videos much, but anytime I like stumble into the, the fitness section, like, no, there's, there's a lot tons of, bloggers, of huge yeah. popular people that are just vlogging I mean, them going to the gym. It's one of those things where, like, a lot of, like, it depends on your gym. Some of them don't let you record. And then, oh, um, true. and then you kind of need someone to film you. You know what I mean? Like, you, like, I mean, you need, like, somebody possible, coming on with you. Yeah. You need, like, a tripod, dude. <laughs> you set it up every time. Yeah. Like, <laughs> make your work go sick. Would you stream, Alish? Would you stream after CS? Um, honestly, I don't. After CS, I mean. If I would stream, it would only be for like a couple months until I would really like get established in something else. I, I don't really think I'm, I'm a streamer. I don't really yeah. feel like I'm a streamer, so I feel it's you. just not for me. I'm with you. On what that do you guys one. think about like players that just become casters or? Uh, I think that's really awesome. Like, like, like I, I love listening to Sean and Jordan and stuff. I agree. Like that's you what know I think they if I ever quit that I would like enjoy yeah. doing. You know, like you know go to events and you can cast. I, or... I like that I could relate to them for sure. Like I could relate to, they've had the same experiences, for example, that I would have had in the, in the in CS. So like when they're speaking, a lot of what they say just makes the complete sense to me from their perspective. Whereas obviously just casters that haven't played the game competitively or on a team or anything like that, they don't have that same insight. Well, it makes sense for analysts specifically. Like like casters that are actually casting the game, I don't think play it matters play, as much because yeah. it's a lot quicker. Like the things happen a lot faster. But if you're like an analyst, like you know, on the desk, like post game stuff like that, it just makes the most sense to have X players doing that. That's just what yeah. makes the most sense. Well, that's why I like. Insight. No offense to any other caster, but like the reason I favor Moses as like a caster just for myself is because he's played. He's played at like a high level competitively in 1.6 and in CS:GO for a little bit. So. Every time he says things and has input on it, a lot of times I agree with it. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that he's been in those situations a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. But sometimes having someone that's better with banter is always nice, too. No, it's for sure. For sure. They always yeah. all have, all have their, like, strengths, for sure. Yeah. I mean, not I, all I players think... can be casters. Not no. everyone has the personality no. for that. It's so. the same thing as streamers, right? Not everybody can be yeah. a streamer. Not everybody it's can really be a hard. caster. Or, well, I'm, yeah, like, I'm, I'm, like I'm, I'm thinking more of analyst than a caster, but I still get what you're saying. Yeah. Well, like for caster, like I think that's why I think Henry G and Sadikist is a good combo because Sadikist is has very good wordplay, and then Henry G was X player as well. So I think that's like the best of both worlds is a casting duo X player, and then a person who's actually good at casting play by play. And with a analyzing, I I think it's always good to have one person on the desk that's witty. Because being witty on the spot isn't easy, by any yeah. means. Like a lot of people, like under like oh, Thorin's the obvious example for banter, but actually doing that live consistently and being known as someone that can think of witty, funny things on the spot is very challenging. Yeah. Like a lot more challenging than people give some of them credit for. 
So yeah, I, I think it's good to have a mixture. I think you definitely should always have an X Pro on an analyst test, though. Yeah. Like hundred percent. Most of them do now too. Like I can't remember the last event that didn't. Now I'm thinking about it. Not any like major event, anyways, or big event. All right, at least but... the major. What are you thinking? You guys, do you think this thing is gonna be like a walk in the park, or is it gonna be super challenging? I, I mean, I think it's gonna be still hard because all yeah. the teams. Just right now, with how the scene is, I think a lot of teams are really, really close. Anyone uh, can be anybody. Yeah. So, yeah, anyone can be anybody. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, Astralis is still going to be there at the major, so right. it's going to be super hard no matter what. But, but, but I you think did that say we're gonna... boot camping, right? You're boot camping. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you exactly. talked about how, like, And one prep... thing, too, like, yeah. after these long breaks, and, like, this happened last time, too. I don't know if it was the last major or the major before. I don't remember, but it was right before. It was right after a player break. Everybody comes back. Everybody boot camps for two weeks, and all the teams are fucking different now. Like, so rusty like, the, kind like, of team. like the teams pre-player break versus teams post-player break. The teams play completely different because one, they've had weeks off. Everybody's had a break now, and they come back, and everybody's doing new shit, and nobody's scrimming yeah. against each other. Like none of the top top teams are scrimming against each other in the boot camps leading up to the major because they don't want to give anything away. So the teams that are now you have teams seeing each other for the first time at the major and it adds like a really interesting dynamic to the event whereas what you were saying earlier if you go to events weekend after weekend after weekend after weekend everybody kind of is playing the same each time because you don't have enough time to really change how your team plays you have enough time to like fix little things here and there but you don't have enough time to change your team's actual gameplay so yeah. I like majors post like like this major right here as from a spectator point of view because obviously I'm not playing in it from a spectator point of view these majors after the player breaks like this are always the funnest to watch. Well, that's why I, I kind of like what I like what Liquid did though is they dropped out of Zotac and turned down the Stockholm invite. So now you have I think five or six people in the first stage of the major at the Zotac land and then most of the people at the major at Stockholm. So you get to sit there, not show any of your cards, and you get to yeah. watch how a bunch of teams are playing currently. And I think that that's a good strategy for, like, just the major. Yeah. I mean, the thing with it was we were only going to have about, like, a couple days of boot camp until we had to go to Zotac. And, I mean, we talked about it, and we just decided that's not enough time because it's only a couple days after that we would have to leave for the major as well. Like, after Zotech is finished, it's only a couple days after that as well, and that is just not enough prep. After coming back from a break mm -hmm. and, like, going into the, one of the biggest tournaments of the year, that's just not enough prep, and it was just not enough. So we decided to completely focus on boot camp and completely focus on just practicing. And also, when we're watching the other teams, we could just steal whatever we think is cool, right, too. That's what like, I was say, yeah. We just steal whatever we want. So we could just add that as well, because we're going to have so much more time than these other teams. Yeah, yeah, that's smart. Yeah, we're going into Stockholm with a two-day boot camp. So it's going to be <laughs> going to be interesting, at least. Count as a boot camp if it's two days? <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> like, think so. It's at, two, it's at Inferno have, Online, so it's, two it's a two practice days. Before. Well, we're playing not in North America, so it's a boot camp to me. <laughs> it's like it might be three days, so you've got... two to three days right. before uh, we play. Nah, I wouldn't call that a boot camp. How has your break stuff been going, Daps? Like, wh like what did you guys do? Because I know that you guys went to Shanghai and all that. Our, so. Yeah, our our break started a lot later, right? So Shanghai yeah. was during the start of the player break. We're we're literally not playing till three days before Stockholm, because people actually had like vacation stuff planned out so yeah and i think it's good like even if we go into stockholm with little to no prep i think and even like uh Pujan said it yesterday like or to me like not on the podcast it's just it, it kind of gives you a hunger back when you don't play for like two to three weeks mm -hmm. um obviously like i told people to continue to dm and like not lose individual level but as long as people don't completely forget smokes and flashes and strats, which I don't think will happen, I don't think it'll hinder our performance that much. Obviously, we're not really going to be able to add anything in two to three days, but I don't think we really have to add anything. But yeah, we're, we're just taking a long, like, not longer break, just our break started. Uh, like so you're, yeah, later. you're starting later and you're ending later, basically. Yep. Then you're going right into a tournament. Yeah. I think people, like, overestimate how much skill you lose you know like uh, a week 
or two off where you still DM a little bit every day. You're not gonna you're not gonna just become bad. <laughs> yeah, usually don't people don't become yeah. bad, they just forget stuff. That's the main yeah. Thing. Like I can see that, the that's my like concern. Like, yeah. 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 Missing well, it, and I think it's a, a lot different when you're actually going to like some island or you're going to some resort or something that you're yeah. not at your computer. If you're actually just having a break and you're just going home and you're just not practicing, that's a completely different break from somebody that's going to Disneyland or something for 10 days because he's <laughs> actually having no time at the computer at all. And Who went to Disneyland for 10 days? <laughs> who was, who was, went to Disneyland for ten fucking days? That was a very specific <laughs> yeah, example. Well, I, I this thought of it. Did, did, Russ go to, did Russ go to Disneyland <laughs> no. for ten days? No, Nick went to some resort for a couple. It wasn't ten days, well, but he just went for a couple of days. A resort, if you go to Disneyland yeah. for ten, fucking yeah, I was just days, making the example of someone that. You're an adult. <laughs> you, you got something. Yeah. Dude, Disneyland no, is I mean, cool stuff. <laughs> Disney World is a little bit better than Disneyland for sure, but Disney World has like an adult park too. Yeah, Disney World you know, better, like, like still an actual break days. when you don't play at yeah. all, it does make the game like more fun. You know, like like you back. like you know when you when you scrim, sometimes you don't like. Everyone likes playing matches, I think, right? I think we all agree like lands and everything are fun to play. Some days you don't really feel like practicing as much as other days, especially if it's been like a grind. You know, like nine days in a row or something. But when you take like a week or two off and you don't play that much and you come back, I feel at least for myself like I like want to play every time I'm playing for a while before it like. But again, younger yeah, players are less effective, right? Like, yeah. Well, yeah, younger players, they just play twenty four seven. Even look at Stewie. Yeah. I think Stewie played CS every day on his break, and streamed. So like that's pure dedication right there. But yeah, for. Like, I definitely get what you're saying. Like, sometimes every all of us have had it where, like, a scrim just deteriorates into just, yeah. this is <laughs> a complete waste of time. Yeah. And then either it starts with you or it starts with the other team, and then you sort of fall. It's hard not to fall into the trap. If, that, like... That's honestly sometimes while playing past a certain hour becomes pointless because, like, if you play too many scrims in a row, people, not that they're not trying, they just, like, lose energy. You know what I mean? Like, you play too much... As a team, like, I'm not saying, you know, six hours is like, definitely doable, but you play 12 hours, which I've done before, that 11th, 12th hour gets almost wasted, I feel like, at boot camps when I've done it. Like, it's just too much for most people. Yeah, you gotta have breaks in the middle. I remember when the, we had first moved out to the Splice House, and that was when teams, which teams have tried to do this so many times, and it always sort of comes in and comes out, but where when scrims start at, like, 11 or 12, at, like, 11 a.m., <laughs> noon, and then that, and then when when that was going on, I remember we could start at like noon. We would scrim and we would play like two maps or three maps until like three, and then we'd get like an hour, two hour break, and then we'd come back and play three or four more that night. That was way better than playing like six hours in a row. Because if you play six hours in a row, being mentally focused for that long, like being at a hundred percent for that long is super draining on people. Like, you need to be able to have that little break in the middle. And people have to realize you're playing versus other teams like MIBR and C. Like, you're not playing versus noobs, right? Like, you're playing versus other people that are really good. So you have to be really focused to, like, combat that. Because it's practice, um, so the entire time you're trying to think of ways that you can be better, your team can be better, what mistakes you're making. What, like, you're always at, like, 100%. Like, you're always, like, it's not like, you know, playing a pug for eight hours. It's not what like playing you, a pug for eight hours. What do you guys think is, like, optimal amount of, like, scrims in a day like if you could pick like the optimal amount of scrims to play like in my opinion i think a best of three an hour break to eat and recharge and like a best of three again after is like good for most teams and that's assuming people are dming and stuff like like their own time um to add on like before practice i think everyone should dm like that's just i think every team kind of agrees on that like universally I, I think it depends on the team because there's a lot of teams that are established and there's a lot of teams that need a shit ton of work because they picked up a new player so depending yeah. on that, um, if it's like an established team, I like the with the, the schedule you said, because I think it's like someone like Astralis, I feel like there's not a lot of, you know, you don't have too much to work on, but you still need to keep the game going. You still need to have everybody remember all the strategies and stuff like that. But for like or newer teams, maps or whatever. Right. But like for the newer teams, I think um, more than that, to be honest, I don't know what the best schedule would be, but definitely more than six scrims or at least parts where like you do practice, dry run, whatever. Oh yeah, I wasn't including like the dry okay, okay. like part. Yeah. But, I but, actually yeah, don't agree. They might have to. I, I mean, like four I th scrims. I think five to six scrims. I think five is honestly a good amount for our team that we've we've like 
been productive at. And it's a good point that you can't actually be at your A game like 100% of the time. And that's where you have to remember that you need to be playing properly as much as you can. Because like I said, like when you're in those like super high intense games and you can't really think as well or something's going on mentally, you're going to be going back into your habits. Like whatever you last were doing, what you're most comfortable doing in practice, if you, like let's just say in practice you go for that last kill against the op, like you one v one the op when it's a three v one or something, just just because like you're bored or whatever, you just want to fight. Maybe one time, like one time, one match, one round, you do that in a in a match, and then you get one v five, you get one v four, one v three. I mean that shit's happened to us like so much. Yep. Like it's, it's actually that happens, so important. Yeah. yeah. And as far as like Astralis, like not needing to play as much, I. I'm pretty sure they're still playing like five to six and they haven't like changed the schedule at all because to stay on top as a team, you can't just stop. You can't just start playing less just because you're the best team. That's exactly how teams like lose, like being the top dog. Uh, and that's why MIBR was a good team for such a long time because I'm, I guarantee that they were playing that much all the time and they had a schedule that they were happy with and they just didn't let up with it. If they, we're at the top, and they're like, uh, guys, let's just start playing three scrims a day. That's when they start losing a lot faster. I, I guarantee they would have been way worse a lot faster, and things would have went really bad really fast. I'm sure that's what Virtus Pro did. Yeah, that's, From that's what a good I heard, point. Like, that's, I'm pretty sure they're a prime example of playing less after being really good. Yeah, if yeah. they like win a tournament, they're like, yeah, dude, we're the fucking best. Let's just start playing two scrims and PUBG the rest. Like, you're gonna suck. You're gonna suck. Plus, I, I feel like it's really hard to do that. I feel like it's really hard to come out <laughs> from like a team that's successful and like not want to play more. I feel like those teams want to play when they get back home and play a lot more. Well, that's why they are the best because they yeah, are the right. teams that are gonna be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I've never liked playing less than five scrims on my team. Like, I, I'm not, a, like, the only days I would maybe say is, like, you know, if you're coming on an extra day on a Friday or a Saturday, maybe you're just doing a best of three that day or something, like, on not, like, a full practice day or something. I think that's, like, not a terrible thing. But, but yeah, generally, I think six is, like, five or six is definitely good. What do you guys think about, um like, optimal start time? Because I feel like younger players like to start later. I would like to play earlier personally because then you get a stop earlier, you know, like you get more of your evening. And I don't think people realize like stopping at 9 p.m., it would be better just to start earlier and then you could end at like 6, you know, like, I don't know. It uh, For our team, definitely have to start earlier if we want to scrim five or six times a night because, I mean, I like to have an hour or two of server time, especially recently, but... If we start scrims late, I always, the last scrim or two are always a waste of time. If yeah. we start late, like if I'm scrimming, if we're scrimming at like 10 p.m. or something, there's you shouldn't even book a scrim versus us if it's at 10 p.m. Because it's all like people get tired because we usually wake up earlier anyways, and also people want to play like that's when FPL starts and stuff. I'm not saying they're prioritizing FPL over scrims, but. It's like we, we could bang out, like we have done it actually recently, where we did five or six scrims in a row, like no break, and we started early, and all of them were good scrims. And like none of them were a waste of time. It just depends on your priority, right? Like there's times where we're messing up a lot of strats and we need more server time than scrims. And then before Shanghai, we just straight up scrimmed. Like we didn't, we're like, we're not adding anything. We just need to play better individually and like sort of like get our teamwork down. So I think it just depends on a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, I personally like starting early and ending ending early, too. Like, we've been starting at 12 and then ending at 7, and I think that's a really good schedule for us. And you're West Coast yeah. right now, right? West Coast now, yeah. Yeah, yeah being on the Which East helps. Coast always makes it worse, because there's been days when, we, when I've been playing scrims at 1 in the morning, you know, because if it starts at... 10 yeah. PST, then we're playing at 1 a.m. Like, like there was days where we finished scrims at 1 a.m. and it was just like fuck. Like first dabs. Yeah. yeah, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. First dabs probably. Uh, first oh yeah. Yeah, dude, it <laughs> sucks know? being East Coast. Like honestly, when I was in school, at, like in high school, like my last year, and I was playing matches. I remember I had this one match that went until two or three in the morning, and I had yeah. school at seven. Qualifier, like, qualifier. Those are the worst. Yeah, like, like an online qualifier that just goes for four bo threes. You have no time to take any breaks, and you're literally still <laughs> yeah. up at two a.m. You yeah. woke up you're at like, like nine a.m. Yeah. Can I get food? No, start now. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's oh. the worst. 
Yeah, no, I, I got lucky in my when I was in grade 12, I had a really cool vice principal. I explained the whole situation to him, and I was like, look, there's going to be times when I'm up till 2 in the morning, and I'm just not going to be coming for the first period. Like, for the first or second period, I'm not going to be here. So me and him just had a deal. I just had to keep good grades, and then I didn't have to go in the mornings if I didn't, yeah. if I was, if I was sleeping. Well, so where you were, like you as long me. as you weren't on math, you were... <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, as long as, yeah, if you're not, if you're not driving your camo truck into the school, you're pretty much good. I have a question regarding, like, the newer meta, like, for everybody, I guess. Like, is that, do you guys think, like, the meta change has, from, like, the year, last year to now, the reason why everybody is playing so close now? Like, every, all the teams between the top 10 or 15 are the reason, like, they could just beat, anyone could just beat anybody? Or, mm. no? Mm. Like, what do you think, why do you think I that is? Like, why do you think all the skills? Team? Like, I okay. just think people are better at killing people, so, like, there's less discrepancy between, like, Nico and, like, mm. I agree with Corey. I, I think it's like w when I play, like even just use complexity as an example. When I play complexity, it's not like my players are all individually way better aim wise than like Android or like Yay when he's playing his peak performance. Like yeah. all of them can aim just as well as my players. So I think it, I think just the gap of skill is closed a lot. Obviously, there's the exceptions of like Nico and. Like All Liquid simple. is the best, best. Like Liquid is like the three best riflers in NA. Fucking Tim's really good. Like obviously there's the exceptions of like really, really, really good players, but I think it's it's a lot closer than it used to be. But I think like now, a, lo like a lot of between, teams of good players. I think now the difference between like the really, really good players though, and this is always kind of the case, but now it's just become like more defined because the skill gap, like uh, skill wise, has gone has gotten smaller. Is the players that play like have that their teams are really well set up and players that make the right decisions are now the the best players because the skill gap is a lot smaller and so players like for example like liquid where they their their team play is really strong like they've always had really good team play so those players now are even though even before they were considered to be the best players now it's a lot more defined that like you can see how good they are because they still have that skill and they have the team play aspect uh, with it, where a lot of teams didn't don't have both of those things as well defined yeah. as certain teams do. Well, yeah, it's like a lot of people say my like my team is insanely high higher skilled than a lot of teams we play, but I disagree. Like I think what makes our team good is um, like e Ethan, especially Ethan is like the most surprising player for me. Cause, like we picked him up; he's younger than most players, but he generally makes very good decisions, very good communication. Um, knows when to do things. Cirque as well. Like Cirque obviously is a very skilled opera, but like he makes good decisions. And he knows like if I put him in a spot, he knows how to individually make that decision. I think that's what separates um certain players from others is that individual decision making. Because like as a caller, I can only call so much and tell people to do so much, but there's gonna be this split second decisions that I can't communicate for them, right? So I think that's what separates really good teams from not like the middle of the pack teams is individual decision making is is yeah. the biggest thing in my opinion yeah it's just about making the right choices because no matter how good your in-game leader is if you are if you hear that little you hear that footstep or a little cue to like run through a smoke or do something that's completely on you and that's like a play that could potentially win you a match so I just feel um, like CS has never been in that huge. same, the same, like, the way it is right now, before. Like, I feel like for a consistent amount of time, you had the top five, and no one can touch that top five for the most part. Like, it was really hard. It was a clear discrepancy between tier one, two, and three. And now I feel like it's all mushed together, and everything's closer. You know, all the teams are closer. It's just, I feel uh, like, t I feel really like tier one still kind of untouchable. I think tier two is just a Less larger so, though, don't you think? Now. Like. Well, uh, like right now, I'd say Liquid, Navi, Astralis are far above most people. And then you have FaZe, who's kind of figuring their stuff out, and then most sports as well. So I think I think there's a pretty clear top five right now. Um, MIBR just picked up Tarek, so they have to figure out their stuff. And then outside of those teams, like even including us, Big, North, Nip... All these other, like, I think everyone can yeah. meet everybody in, like, this huge group of Tier 2 teams. Well, I kind of think that a lot of the good teams just got worse. 
Like, I actually think that the scene isn't playing as good. I, th I think that the individual players have gotten better, but I think the teams have gotten worse just from a bunch of a, a bunch of random things that have been happening. Honestly, for a lot of them, it's it's been really unfortunate. Like, uh, FaZe hasn't been able to play with Olaf. Uh, the French scene is non-existent for months when they were top dogs. Fnatic had the whole thing where they did the roster swaps, roster swaps, roster swaps back and forth. Nothing's working because they're just destroying chemistry. And I actually think the NA scene has, as a whole, gotten a lot better. So I, I think it's a, a little easier to dissect it like that because I think the NA scene, I think this is the strongest that we've ever been as a scene because, like Daps was saying, a lot of players just has a lot more information. They know a lot more things, what's right and what's wrong, how to play actual team play. And that's why you're seeing... Like, the middle of the pack teams are a lot better because back in the day, it really was just C9 and us and then Optic and then everybody else was just horrible. And now, I'm at, like, we can actually get good practice against any team, really, that's in professional right now. And that really wasn't the case. But, like, we would actually just get bored just playing against all the teams and we just start fucking around because it's not, not just, like, fucking around, but obviously we're not at the same energy level because our aim is just so much better or the team is just pushing us and doing dumb things and we're just killing them. It's like, okay, well, we can't even, we can't even do a strat because they're just dying. Like, they're just, they're, we're just yeah. killing them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and now it's not really like that. I think teams are a lot more prepared, a lot more disciplined than they used to be in the NA scene just because uh, I, I think that's the scene that I'm more qualified to talk about just because I've played them the most. So I think, I think that's just like the midpoints that I have for that. I think what do you there's a, uh, you can go, Corey. No, it's fine. You go first. Okay. Um, I think there's just a lot more stability too. Cause yeah. like, every time pro league ended, there'd always be like four teams or there was like a three man swap. Yeah. A lot of the time. I feel like that's teams are growth, making, yeah. yeah, I feel like <laughs> it's, it's reverse now where like yeah. NA is actually like respecting chemistry and like actually trying to figure out internal problems rather than just being like let's just pick up this guy because he's better on paper and we hope it works so i think um man like i don't know if it's players figuring out that stability matters or if it's management but i think uh teams not making three-man swaps every season is is important to it as well and I think that uh, SK slash MIBR, I think that they were really good role models for the scene because as soon as they came in, they showed us that, I mean, they were a team that was nothing and then they became the best, like doing it all from within our scene. I mean, sure, they had tons of boot camps in Europe, but primarily they were playing in our scene. And I think that was really motivating for a lot of players. And we could see just how structured CS that they were playing and something that we can emulate. And I think a lot of players took that to heart and that's why NA is a scene as the best it's, that it's been. And they stayed stay together for like a lot longer than most NA teams have, so. Yeah. I mean, it's easy when they're winning, right? Yeah. So what do you think everything. about uh, like the Tarek and the Stewie move of them leaving? Like, do you, do you think that's a mistake on their part? Do you think C9 should have stuck together? Um, Honestly, I don't know like what happens after the major. I, I think that there was very clear internal issues that were masked with their win, and as soon as the major was over and they they had the first loss at summit i think that's when it just completely went downhill from there and the issues couldn't be masked anymore with having the success so i i mean honestly they i'm sure that they're doing the best decisions they have with the info they have but there clearly was some really big problems they kind of pulled a a gambit in a way cuz i think like c9 was definitely probably considering changing someone before the major ever happened that they won. Yeah, I'm and sure. And Ga Gambit was the same. It was like Zeus was going to leave before that, or, like, I heard Gambit was, like, a dead team going into the major they won. Like, apparently they didn't scrim at all, or... I just remember there was something going on. Yeah, they yeah. Were, apparently they were practicing yeah. going down and leaving scrims. And, like, yeah, I, th I think up on time and I could like be wrong, but from all the things I heard and read, Gambit was pretty much a dead team going into the major. That's the best way to play a major, though, because everyone's, like, got tons of pressure and you're just there like fuck it we're dead boys and you just <laughs> you just frag out yeah so yeah. I, I don't know i guess that was the major immortals made it yeah okay yeah i think that was the case but i get i think that's playing without pressure is huge too because even didn't i buy power do that that was like a classic case where they came second at, at face it land in italy 
and their their team was falling apart, and they that was like the biggest NA accomplishment internationally, I think, at that time. So yeah, I mean, I guess being a dead team has its perks. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they were a dead team, but if there's any, team, like... I mean, some players just, I mean, some personalities just can't work together, and not that, like, I don't know, just chemistry just doesn't always work out, and that's why as teams you're always trying to find the best things that you can to improve like the team and environment, and play style, everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I really don't have any insider information on any of this. This is pure speculation. But, like, I feel like MIBR, when they when they did the Stewie pickup, I don't feel like that was... That, that, that wasn't who they wanted when they made that pickup. And this is just speculation on my part. I'm not saying that as fact. I don't think that was who they wanted. Obviously, we know that they were trying to get simple and flamey and all that stuff. But I it just... It doesn't... It didn't make sense from their point of view, to make that move. It didn't make sense from their point of view. It, it made sense from Stewie's point of view to go over there. If he was unhappy with Cloud9 and you have the chance to join SK, that makes sense from his point of view. But from their point of view, it didn't make sense. doesn't matter how good Stewie is. It just didn't make sense from their point of view. Simple only barely made sense because of how good he is. <laughs> like, if it was any... like Because you, you can ignore the language barriers and you can be like, well, you know what? It's simple, so it's okay. We can, we can make this work. But I, I didn't think that that move made sense for them. And I, and I think now, I think bringing in Tarek is like a fix to that. It's like that's them trying to fix that problem that they had when they brought in Stewie. Like the problem that it generated. Because Tarek and Stewie together, it, it makes Stewie less odd man out. And it also brings in another English speaker. And it brings in somebody who is a very likable person. Like Tarek's a really likable guy. And I think it, it'll just overall make the team environment better. Well, I, I think they definitely had a plan. I think Stewie just joined the right team at the wrong time because I don't think they um, really considered how big of a change changing languages was. I think if Stewie came in to that team and they were like completely had their like system set, it, they knew all the callouts. I'm sh- right. Like just no. spoke English properly. Right. I right. think I think it's just a process, right? Like I think. I think by the end of the year, MIBR will be just as good as they used to be, or close to it. Right. Well, that, that's because I'm sure that's they're much, a lot more comfortable. That's with pretty it much right what now. I was saying, though, is that it made sense for Stewie to go to them, but yeah. at that time, it didn't make sense for them to pick up Stewie. Because well, of the I mean, they they, they were, were struggling having. a lot, though. Right. That's what I mean. That's why it didn't make sense to. But like, they've okay, played. You have to think about it. They know. Let's add in more problems. That but they know so all that they've either played with or know all the Brazilian players they could get. If you think about it. Like, yeah. they probably pulled out the list of every Brazilian player, and they're like, okay, let's look at international options now. And the international options are obviously way better. I mean, I do agree it's with the lot, whole lot not, having, not having time thing, because I, I do agree with him not joining at the right time, because when they did pick him up, I know it was like a decision, kind of like a hasty decision, since they wanted Simple and Flamey, but they, they ended up with Stewie anyway. I'm sure they wanted other players in between that, too. Yeah, yeah and then they ended up with Stewie. And then Stewie. But when they ended up with Stewie, basically, like, it was the middle of the season. And I know exactly what that feels like, because I joined Cloud9 exact same time as when, or like a week after Stewie left. So we were just mid-season with, like, no time to practice or implement anything. So I think for them, the adjustment period was, became a lot harder because they were just playing matches every day. Like, the second he joined, they were just playing matches. And then they had a LAN, and then they had more they matches. Did, they, they had a LAN. They planned to pick up Tim and Stewie there originally, right? Like, they were yeah. going to cut bolts, I believe. Yeah. So that makes a little bit more sense, right? You're going yeah. to kind of 3-2, make it a little bit easier. Yeah, Tim got an offer, and I think he declined. I'm not really sure, 100%, but yeah. I mean, when they did that change and just deciding to be an international team, like everybody, like including them and the fans, like everyone has to realize that it's going to be a process. You, you can't just change language and the way that you talk and comms all of a sudden and still keep the same level and especially like Dap said they they weren't playing as well like when they were making the changes as well so i think that's something to consider that it's it's a process when you're making a huge change like that i, I also yeah. always felt like they made kind of questionable decisions on using bolts cuz like bolts was insane when he was on immortals like that guy was just owning like just 25 kills every game at least then he joined them and he just kind of was he never looked was, comfortable at yeah. any point on SK, and, yeah. and I never understood because, like, you join and they could have just put him in small sites, but they always put him at like big sites to anchor him. But like on Immortals, he was always like in or on train, you know, be on cash and stuff, and he just got stuck at like A on every map. And I just, 
I thought like it didn't make much sense, but I mean they they probably know more than I do, obviously, because it's like their team. But I just I don't know. I, I think they just I didn't have do. faith in him as like that role. I think they like uh, Bolts was really good before he joined the team, and I don't think they gave him what he wanted, and they had different plans for him, and it just didn't work out. Yeah, so, like, I, he didn't, like, play, like, any of his normal spots. He kind of just filled into the spots that were needed because all the other spots were comfortable and they're doing good. And it's just that one spot that needed fixing, I guess. And he wasn't able to have that same level of impact on those spots. Yeah. I mean, Because he was yeah, one I don't of know. the hardest people to play against on Immortals. Like, Henny was annoying the way he plays. It's just, like, really frustrating to play against. But Bolts was just... Oh my god, it just sucked to play against him because he wasn't over aggressive. He was just he always was like waiting for you. And he and he was always ready and he would always hit the shot and he was so annoying to play against and then when he made the transition it just it didn't really just pan out for him, which kind of sucks for him. Cuz this is the second time for him now to play on that team and have it just not work out. Yeah, I, I just uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, I, I was just gonna say just to finish it. I don't think I think Bolts is meant to sort of be like the standout guy on his own team, like not play under those guys. Because every time he's not been on their team, he's played exceptionally well. So yeah, I was gonna ask like how um how does like how would you like describe Nick's calling? Is it more like a lot of people giving him input a lot of the times, and he's able to mid round really well, or is he more of a structural caller as well? Like would or a mix of both? Yeah, I just want to quickly add, I think he is criminally underrated as an in-game leader. By people. Well, I think just because people don't know, you know? Yeah. People don't know him as an in-game leader. Just like people don't know him as an opera, so he's underrated as an opera, too. Yeah. Like, when people mention NA operas, he's never mentioned either. So it's like, yeah. Yeah, so right now it's basically a mix, and if you want to be a top team, you basically have to be a mix. Uh, I think he is a really good mid-round caller, even before when we had other callers, like him and I would help with mid-round stuff and help give ideas, and then he kind of just turned into the caller that is going to be giving ideas mainly. Uh, any of us could be giving calls at any point. Like I, I like helping him out with calls if I think that we should do something. Um, it it kind of just depends on how the other team is playing. Like. I, I don't know, it's really hard to say because really we're doing everything. Like we're defaulting and we're he's having really good mid round calls or he'll see like a read that he sh that we should do and uh he'll make a call uh, an execute or a strat right off the right off spawn. Um it, it kinda just depends and I think that as a caller right now you have to be able to do everything and I think that he has been doing that role pretty well. Like I, I think he is pretty underrated and he has been doing a really good job. Yeah. What does Zeus do to complement that, do you think? Because I know we talked touched on it at the start, but like I don't have like a full vision like scope of like exactly what he does to help Nick or you guys out specifically. Um so are we talking like in a tournament setting or in, in a tournament, like a in a tournament. In a tournament. So in a in a tournament setting, usually like when the match is going on, if Zeus ever like sees either if some if, if we die, if we lost a round in a super stupid way and obviously people are just tilted, like he he's he is one of the uh, coaches that is going to be super helpful with anything psychological and he he can sense like those types of things and as soon as he sees something off he could just call a timeout and be like guys let's get back into this or if he sees something tactical that we should do then he'll uh, call a timeout and uh, like say a strat that he thinks will work but I think something that's important that we've learned through experience is that uh, like especially with Stanislaw when he was on the team, if our caller is making a lot of good calls, like and he's really in the zone and everything that he's calling is right, and maybe just the late rounds not working, it's it's been super important for Zeus to just let that keep going. So it, it's only really when a change of pace is needed, or Nick is just obviously lost, or and no one else is helping. Like if Nick is lost, uh, or not like saying that he's lost, but he doesn't have like a, a clear idea of. Uh, like what we should be doing, then obviously that comes on to like me or NAF next, who usually are going to be giving calls next for that. And if all of us seem completely no no idea what we should be doing, then uh, Zeus will come in and he'll just say what we should be doing. So why didn't Stanislaw work out on the team? What was the difference between him in game leading and Nick in game leading? Let's say was it the way that you're doing it now, which like you said, Nick is the in game leader, but there's a lot more people giving input. Whereas maybe when Stanislaw was on the team, there wasn't as much of that. Like how how was it different, and why didn't it work out? 
So Stanislaw, the way that he calls is it's it, it's very like um, off spawn. He's going to be like saying like what every single person should be doing, and only some rounds we would be defaulting and like working the map in a certain way, or we would be defaulting like in different spots like every other round. Like it, it was it was very uncomfortable for me as uh, for me and other players as well, where we weren't like kind of like doing like the same things every round and working things because in the past that's how we always worked it. Uh, and I think that Nick has taken a lot of the things that he does as an in-game leader just stemming off of what's worked and leaving out the bad from past callers. And a, a solid baseline probably has been from Adren, where that was super default heavy and we just worked the map. Uh, so we were all really used to that and that's what most of our success was. Uh, and Hiko obviously would just like call default just off, off spawn and we would just mid-round from there. Um, so that's what most of our success was, and it really just, like, wasn't working with us, like, as a team. Like, it, it just wasn't clicking. The, the style of the calling just wasn't working for us. So we, we decided that we wanted to uh, have Nick go back into it, and I, I, I forget. Um, I think it was, it was either Nick or Stan. I don't really remember off the top of my head, but one of them wasn't, like, feeling comfortable, like, individually, and they felt that they needed a change to have more impact. I think Stan wanted to go back to lurking. And uh, Nick said that he would call, and we were all for it. And as soon as that it started, we didn't really want to stop because we thought it was all going really well. It was the calling style that we were really used to. He was having ideas that were really good. It was, it was completely different from the other time that he tried calling because Nick has obviously tried in-game leading, I think, like a year and a half ago or two years ago. I don't remember exactly when it was. And it just didn't work out. And after Nick has uh, experienced more calling oh, from... Yeah, like other callers coming into the team, he's really implemented that into the way that he's calling, and I think that's the way that it's been working out the best for us, where primarily we're going to be defaulting and taking map control because that's the best way to be working maps, and also being able to just call like an execute or a rush or something completely random just to keep, catch the other team off guard has been working out really well for us. Yeah. I was, yeah, I was always curious, to be honest. Pimp's making his return to CS:GO. I don't know much about Pimp. You played. You were on a team with him, right, John? Yep. Okay. How how is Pimp as a team? I I don't know how long he's on the team, or if it's even worth bringing up. But uh, he was on the team for a bit. Um. So when he was coming into the team, I I I, th I think that we kind of had just like a a disconnect, like with how he wanted the roles to be and everything like that. And he kind of just never was comfortable in the role that he was in. And he was really unhappy with that. It wasn't performing as well as he could have because he wasn't comfortable in the role. And I think the team environment wasn't that good because of all the problems with that type of stuff. But I, I think that he's a, a really good player. Like, his comms are really good. He's able to double up. Like, he, he wasn't able to do a lot of the things that he was able to do. And I think that if he has that type of freedom in, in a team... Uh, and the new team that he's going to be joining, if that is true, I, I think that it could work out. And he's a really solid secondary caller as well. Like, he always had ideas. Like, everything was always flowing. I, I think that just in terms of the roles that we needed, it, it just wasn't working out with us. Right. And I think that's definitely, like, a problem with us, like, how we, how the whole, like, picking him up even went. Because that should have been way more clear when it was happening. True. All right, well, I'm out of questions. All right, what do you guys think about the Catholic priest that just abused, like, a thousand children in Pennsylvania? I saw that, uh, actually. I saw that. Yeah, I see that no shit? Yeah. They're, they're just always at it. it, dude. They're so dedicated, you know? Just everywhere they go, just raping, you know? Just... <laughs> just <laughs> it never I, stops. I'm not advocating for it. I'm just saying they're... They got a good system, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. They'd be good strat callers, probably. Speaking of not advocating for anything, like, I'm not, like, a huge advocate of genocide, you know, being in my family history is Jewish, but I was driving today, and I'm, there's, it's a two lane, it's two lanes, and there's somebody in the left lane driving the same speed as somebody in the right lane, so you can't go past them. If anybody needs to be genocided, it's probably those people. Because those people make me so mad. I can't, I can't even... I don't know. I don't know how many of you drive because I know I don't know if you drive finesse or Elise. I drive, but I don't think I've ever experienced that. You've never. I don't think I've ever I wanted to genocide. Not that feeling. No. no. Oh, <laughs> absolutely, feeling. it makes me so mad. When I mean, I'm I don't know if we can be monetized on YouTube anymore, but we're not monetized anyways. 
Oh, okay. So we're doing this for free, <laughs> so we're I guess. We're doing this for free. We've been doing All right, everyone, this is time. our last podcast. Apparently, uh, it's been real, though. We've been doing this for free the whole time. We have been. We need to plug the like our social like the social medias more during the podcast thing because I have it in the description every time, but like we never tell people to subscribe, we never tell people to go follow the Twitter, you know, we never you do, do any now. of that. That's what I just did in a really you All know right, smooth way. Put like an intermission in the middle and just have like a ad voice, like, yeah, everyone. Just right now, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, everything. Just do it, just in the middle. Yeah. Need the slide, yeah, the sliding text. Just yeah. to come across the screen right now. I mean, Davey, you're the, the editor in chief here. You're the <laughs> I'm renderer. I'm the recorder, I'm the renderer, I'm the yeah. editor, I'm the. I okay, let's all. not give you too many titles. That's what I do, I do it all. Just. You're, you're the render, guest getter. Just fine. Yeah, I, I. Logistics over here. <laughs> okay, Corey. Jacked, jack dude, <laughs> nutritionist, <laughs> personal the trainer, the, the show nutritionist, who John, he's still working comedic on his presence. What do you mean, Dave? He's Everyone has to have a role. Here. He's our uh, what's a, the quota? You know, <laughs> I have no idea. What <laughs> the, the, non, the non-white guy quota. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> Every company's got to have a quota. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh my god, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Yeah, because well, the, the Brazilian scene has never recovered. <laughs> even even <laughs> LG true. right now isn't performing well. So that, he's just he's ruined the Brazilian scene. They've never recovered. Okay, well I think I think we're pretty much done. It's uh, it's been what almost an hour and a half. I mean, I got through all my questions I wanted to ask. So, if you guys else have, any, have any, anything else you wanted to talk about? To add? Nope. Oh, I have a question, I guess. Ask us a question, give it to it. <laughs> Finesse, so like, what is... Finesse, so, so since that you haven't been playing with C9, have you just been like playing FPLs, or what have you been doing to really like keep like keep everything up to date, like being ready to join like the next team, like, just FPLs? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, I was going to stream, but then I realized that right now I'm like... It's just not something that I really want to do. It's like similar to a lot of different people that have either been on pro teams or want to join a pro team. It's like I don't have like a set passion for it. I feel like I have the personality for it, but I don't have the passion for it. So I don't really want to jump into something and then not enjoy it and just let it go. So if I want to give, if if I want to stream at some point, then I think I'm just gonna want to give it 100% to it, like a lot of like people like Jason R have done and stuff. Uh, so as far as that, yeah, like I just try to FPL and DM like couple hours a day for sure but as far as like i've never been the type of person and i feel like this is to my like downfall is i've never been the type of person to like message other people to see like if i can make a team with them or like message them different ideas because i know daps is talking to me about this about like um talking to different teams about ideas of like how i would be able to better fit them i usually do that in like my opening interviews after teams have approached me but mm -hmm. as far as like me approaching teams like i never do that's nothing, nothing out of ego or anything like that i just don't I don't feel comfortable with that aspect of like CS in general. Like I don't feel I should be the one to take the step to like ask teams to join them. If they if they feel like my skill set is something they need, they know better than I would. So then they should approach me. So as far as that's concerned, like I've had a few offers and stuff like that, but I'm just like contemplating offers and playing uh, FPL, DMing a bunch and just the normal stuff. Like I never, I don't think I'll ever come to a point where like, unless I completely quit CS where I won't do any of that stuff. Yeah, so, like, I mean, we've all seen, like, how complexity has been, like, transformed from a team that isn't really good at all to, honestly, like, they, they've yeah. completely changed, and they're honestly really good. So yeah. have you, like, thought of, like, bringing another player with you and joining one of those teams that is struggling, like, maybe, like, an EU United or Dignitas or any team that you think really has potential to really, like, just add everything that you two or you have to offer and completely transform them? Uh, Yeah, obviously I've thought about it, but, again... Like, it, it just comes down to the, what the other, like, the actual team thinks. So, like, those teams, if they approach me, I'll have, like, a conversation with them and, like, ask them who they're trying to replace. Or if they're asking me who they should replace, then I'll give them my input on it. But as far as NA is concerned right now, I'll be honest. I guess this is, like, a general, I'll say to all of you. I feel like right now NA has a decent amount of 
people that have the same skill set I do in terms of in-game leading. Like Rogue, for example, has Cadian, who I think does a really good job. And I think Rogue has improved tremendously. I think Complexity has improved a lot outside of those DreamHack events. They obviously won the minor, so they're on like a upward trajectory, I guess. So those two teams that I named, um, Ghost have Steel. And I think they've just given up all hope of making the major, so they probably just like, oh, screw it, we're not going to care about the major, we're just going to try to attend. Calling anymore, isn't he? Oh, he I think he is. he is. He is. He must be. I think he is. Yeah, and I I've always had like respect for his calling and stuff like that, so Josh, I've had him as a coach as well, so I know he's capable of doing that as well, and frag really high, so he's their caller for Ghost, and I think he should stay. Um, basically, the only teams that I feel like maybe need callers are like Corey's team, potentially, if they need a caller, and... United because Skyler I don't think has been a caller before and I'm not saying he's like a bad caller but he's just never been one before mm -hmm. so and I know Corey mentioned like how hard it is I think it was like one of your YouTube videos or something Corey where like you said it's like really hard to call and like op and stuff yeah. so those are the only two teams and uh, the entire NA region that don't have a caller that's like doing really well at the moment or the team isn't doing really well because like you said like the NA region itself is like improving a lot and I don't want to join an MDL team, to tell you the truth. Like, I don't want to take that step back because I feel like it's too much of a grind. And the way I see it, a lot of the players that do play in FPL already kind of turn me off from playing yeah. with them because I feel like they're very... I'm not going to say they're disrespectful, but they're it's just a different breed. It's it. a different... I don't, want, I don't want to say that because I honestly don't know what's in their head. Like, I don't know well, how they think, think or feel. Okay, but you can say they act very disrespectful. I just think they have the type of egos... And it's okay to have an ego, by the way. But it's the type of egos that clearly shows, and I don't like that. Like that's the part. It's like it's it turns me off from being on a team with them, but I don't mind playing a field with them. Yeah, so. I mean, United was honestly the team that I was thinking in my head because, yeah. uh, like the c past couple of months, they've had really good results. They've been doing upsets when the online leagues were going on. They were beating. They beat us. They beat uh, MIBR, and I, I think that that could be just like another potential complexity team that, yeah. just with a little bit more structure, a little bit more like veterans in the team like telling them how to how to do things right they, they could become the second complexity oh, yeah, I, I think I, complexity is like one of the role models for the scene it's like yeah this this is how things could just like change like this when you just bring a super experienced igl to the team and obviously shazam's yeah. a really good opera as well yeah no i agree with you i think if they obviously offer me which i haven't gotten an offer from united or anything but if they did i, I was i would definitely consider it but like i said Rick, right now the nac is just doing too well i think for for there to be any changes needed, to be honest. Because it depends. a lot of the results have been pretty good for some of the teams. Time to go to Europe, dude. I think <laughs> United I think United hasn't been doing well enough to not consider it. Yeah. Like I, I, mean, I, don't, yeah. I don't know how their games have been going, but I think Skylar's good enough not to call. And I mean Thank I don't you. think they have one experienced person on that team. Like Sky Skylar's probably the most experienced one on the team. Yeah, they're definitely good. Not, like, they're, they're like definitely like remind me of a Cole for sure. Like this exact same thing. But the thing I liked about Cole a lot, which United as an org might not do. I don't know if they do or the not. United but... org is fantastic. I can tell you I, from personal. Oh, are they? Experience. Okay. Well, yeah. I know as Cole out of any organization I've been to, and this is like I like all the organizations I've ever had. Cole is by far and away like they just stepped up to a whole new new level on how good they were to me. Like just to, to me, the players. Everything they gave us, I feel like it was just like meant for a tier one, like top three team in the world, and they gave all of that to us just to make sure. So I'm not surprised at all that they're playing so well, because um, I feel like the structure, even organized, and in terms of the org, is there. You know, they give the players everything that they need. So, um, but yeah, I just don't think any teams really need any like type of change right now. To be honest with you, I think I it mean, just depends. I don't really on... agree with that. <laughs> I don't know I don't for sure, though. That That's the thing. Like, I don't know what their mentality is, but the way I see it, and you said this yourself, is like when you scrim these NA teams, a lot of times they're a lot better than they were a year ago, you know, and they're improving. So I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that, like, even if Complexity had three bad events in a row, they had the major, minor victory. So now it's like an upward trajectory. Now, if they go downhill, then maybe they'll, like, consider me or other teams will consider me. I don't know. But as far as that's concerned, of course, I feel like. I would never go away from the IGL role. Like I, I love that role, and I think it's what I'm best at. But yeah, as far as that's concerned, I think a, a lot of NA teams think they're content right now with who they have. That's just what I think of them. They, I've never like talked to any of them. I think that's yeah. kind of what Elise was touching on, though. Is like when I when I was cut from Optic, I had like five offers, right? All yeah. all from the teams that weren't Liquid and C9, and obviously right. Optic because I was cut from them. So when I was given all those offers. 
like I think Energy was the team that was like least interested in me because they had like other plans and like Peacemaker was the manager for a bit or whatever. But yeah. what I did was the player I wanted to play with the most was Breezy by far. I was like if I like if I'm like I paired myself with him so I increased the value of myself because a lot of people wanted to play with him too. Right. So it was like I increased my value. I had a vision, a specific vision. Um, one of the teams that offered me didn't kind of see my vision and didn't want to make the changes I wanted. And energy was the one place where I could sort of make that work. Obviously, yeah. it took like pretty much a year for it to actually start working out properly. But I mean, I, I think it is important to sort of like articulate Obviously, if you don't have a vision for any of these teams, then you can't just go to them yeah. and be like, here, blah, blah, blah. But if you do see, like, here's a, pl a player I really want to, like, team up with, and then you sort of just sort of slowly transition the team into what you think will work, then I think that's important. I agree with you. I think that's definitely something that people should do in, like, everyday life is, like, in terms of just negotiating skills and being able to put themselves ahead of stuff. But I just feel like right now, and I just don't know how the scene is working. Like, I feel like a lot of teams, because I haven't been approached by some of these NA teams that you guys have mentioned, it just comes down to, like, in my opinion, I just think they just think they are content right now with their progress and don't really need someone like me. I, I think it just depends. Because, like, like you said, Complexity had... Complexity and Rogue both made the major, right? All right. But outside of that... I mean, Rogue had the final at the Dream Hack. I'll give them that. So and then there's Ghost, right? Who made a bunch of lands just they now. They made three lands, so it depends on yeah. how they do with those lands too, right? So it's right. like, let's let's hypothetical here. Complexity made the major, won the minor. They come last at the major qualifier, or the, yeah. what's called the major now. So it's like, while they made the major, the progress, progress could instantly be halted. No, I agree, and that's why I and feel like me being patient is the way to go right now, because... I don't want to just join a team that, like you said, that I have no vision with, or yeah. bit, like vision in, like a future. But I do want to join a team with an organization like Complexity, for example, because I've had experience with those people, and or like a team similar to that. So I would be open to all offers, like I said, and I've gotten a few, but it's nothing that I've been interested in so far. So I just keep my game up. I do the best that I can. I watch all the matches that I can possibly watch with with my, which with my time, I have, me having a lot of time, I just watch all the games. So. Or all the big lands, at least. So in that sense, I'll definitely like keep playing and keep grinding until I completely quit, I guess, and then we'll go from there. Like you consider coaching ever for like a good. Time? I have, but I just feel like I'm not there yet. Yeah. I, I thought about it though. Like I don't know if how because I, I know Daps did it for a little bit. It's you just have to, yeah. you have to be completely over playing, right? Because like <laughs> I I, I want to like that little. I know Davey touched on it on the Thorn interview. The real reason I wanted to coach was because I was actually I wanted to quit playing like four times that year because I was miserable with the team that I had, right. and uh, I didn't get along with certain players on the team. So I personally was not having any fun. I had no, no motivation to do anything, and uh, I was like upset at myself because I was putting zero effort in. Um, once those changes happened, and once we sort of started to get on track, I realized coaching was really boring. When you go from a player to a coach, it's very hard, in my opinion. Like, you actually have to be completely overplaying yeah. to coach, in my opinion. No, that's what I assume. Um, <laughs> so that's what I don't yeah, assume. so I came back after, like, three weeks and then just kept playing. Um, because the team tried, like, Fugly was calling and tried it out, but, like, nothing was really working. Um, and, yeah, so I, I think, yeah, for co coaching, I think it's easier for people that haven't been a player. Yeah. Like for for our co I'm a pet for example, like he loves coaching. Like I don't know how he could oh, love coaching as much as he does. But, but for him, because... it's, been a, it's a rise from Twitch. Mod. Yeah, exactly. He's never yeah. really been a player, so. All right, exactly. But it's, it's not it's not even like discrediting the coaching role. It's just like if you've never played before, it's a lot easier. I feel to enjoy your job. Yeah, I can see for that. sure. So yeah, I actually to, have. Oh, sorry. Uh, you keep going. No, I was gonna say to answer your question because I know we just went off on a big tangent. Yeah. It was just because I feel like a lot of NA teams are just content with what they what they have currently as well. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. Uh, I was gonna say uh, DAPS. So 
our team has done a lot of IGL swaps, obviously, as you know. And even, like, I've tried it for, like, a couple days, and I was just like, man, this is way too hard. Like, And you really, like, really, you honestly respect, like, how hard IGLing is and what an IGL needs to, like, do things well. Because, um, like, for me, in my experience, when I just did it for, like, a couple days, when we were like, oh, yeah, let's, let's try something different because nothing was working. Like, the first day, it was like, yeah, I have a ton of ideas. I know exactly what everything's going on. And then the next day, I remember, like, having, like, a cast room where no one was, like, giving me any info of, like, anything that was going on in the map. It's just like, how am I supposed to call with this? And then, like, after I decided I can't do it, that makes me, like, super appreciate how, how like, how much, like, an IGL needs and how hard it is and what you need to be providing for an IGL. And I, I think that's, mm-hmm. like, something that was super important for everybody on the team because at a per- at so at a Sorry, at a certain point in the team, like everybody has tried IGLing, uh, just for at least like a couple days, just to see how it was or whatever. And and now for your team, Fugly tried IGLing. Do you think like anything has really changed like from him as a player since he tried IGLing for that period of time? He said, I mean, he 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 definitely uh, appreciates it more because when he when I was coaching and he was calling he'd come to me for a lot of things, right? Like advice or like this guy's not doing this. It's like the main thing, the main uh, shock that comes to people when they first try calling is, Oh, these guys aren't listening to me. Or like, (laughs) it's like, why aren't you, why aren't you coming back to be quicker? Like I'm, I want to do this now, you know, like they notice the little things of like, cause like when you're just a player, like let's say I'm a, I'm Brax and I'm, lurking door on cash every round right it's like i'm focused on lurking door on cash and spamming the door a bunch i'm not focused on all my teammates not listening to the igl and potentially not doing correct things right it's like when you call you notice all the little things going wrong slowly and around that you normally wouldn't i think that's something that fugly like realized right away is like yep. like this is annoying like people aren't listening to me at certain times people are forgetting strats and then because like some like my biggest problem over my career was my temperament with people um it's definitely something that's improved over time but one thing i always used to get mad is like how do you like forget a smoke like if i can remember all of your roles and all your nades that you throw on a strat how do you not remember your smoke (laughs) like it blows my mind like this is pathetic you're getting paid to play a skate like never had i don't i dilute I lose it sometimes. I'd be like, "This is embarrassing." Dude, I can't tell and you how just... many times we had this one strat, and I don't mean to put exotic on blast, but we had this one strat on train, and all you gotta do is smoke e box. That's it. Yeah. Just smoke e box. That's all you have to do. And there was one time where I, I can't even exaggerate. It was in practice. We ran it four or five times in this practice. He forgot it every single time. You'd even tell him like. Dude, remember this round. You have to smoke Ebok. Yeah, I got it, bro. I got it. I got it. And he'd run up and he'd run up, and then it'd be like, okay, go. And he'd just be standing there, not throwing it. And then and then he'd be waiting for like five seconds. Like, oh, go now. It's just like, dude. Oh my god, I can't deal with this shit right now. I, I used to die all the time because I was the guy who would always die from it. That's why it, it's so burned into my memory because I would be the guy going out mid first. Well, one time he missed it. It landed like behind the Ebok, and he said a guy ran up and blocked it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was he, like, oh, yeah, he God. missed the smoke. It landed like, like it bounced too far and landed like on the opposite side of the e box. And he was like, he must have blocked it, bro. He's like, oh yeah, he blocked <laughs> the smoke on the opposite side of the e box. That was like, that was like lucky. We played our one of our first Mirage land matches was on Mirage versus Virtus Pro, who had just won IEM Katowice. And lucky had to throw the window smoke from CT spawn or from T spawn in the old Mirage. He missed it 15 rounds in a row, and every round he had a different excuse, which blew my mind. He was like, dude, dude, the clowns changed. Dude, they changed the map. Dude, it was the craziest, most at elaborate some point, shit. At some point, I didn't even though, get mad. I'm like, bro, this is incredible. You just came up with 15 different excuses. That's fucking sick. <laughs> at but, some point, though, if he misses it 15 rounds in a row, yeah. like, at some point, this has to be your fault. No, no, no. Then it turned into a prack. No, no. Then it turned into prack. I'm just like, all right, we got to get this smoke. I don't even care about this victory anymore. Just hit the fucking smoke. Let me get up connector. We have Pasha jumping out the window, running up mid. They're just screaming the shit out of us. I'm like, all right, it's two It's all right guys yeah i think uh i think i swear to god i have like a trend like twist used to do this on tsm and like people change their view model and their res and their crosshair but they don't relearn their smokes and then 
like it's not that they forgot it it's just they didn't put in the effort to relearn it once they changed their shit so i'm just like make a bind to make it go back or relearn it i like, actually have that crazy. me and uh me and nitro have both of those binds oh for, really for your view model? yeah yeah you i think have, it actually you have is the super big helpful. crosshair bind too the one that puts your crosshair no, across the whole map i, I don't like that one, that one. <laughs> i like that one <laughs> Do you have the gun bind, the switch switch of the hands? Yep, I yeah, I do. One. Yeah. Because sometimes I just learn something with a different view model, and then I'm just like, okay, I'll just I'm not gonna learn it some complicated other way. I'm just gonna do it the I've, easier I've way. I've been lucky. I've I've haven't changed my view model, my sensitivity, my I changed my res recently. Like I, I played on native forever, and then like six months ago I changed to 1280 960, and that's about it. But I was on native all before that. I don't know. My favorite smoke story was when I was on liquid before you joined Elige, we were at the major qualifier in Poland, and we switched who smoked... Uh, like, back then, you used to throw the window smoke near T-Halls, right? Where you yeah, yeah. ran and throw it. So we gave that duty to Naf. We're like, Naf, you don't need your smoke. You're lurking halls at A every round, pretty much. So we play the match against Flipside, and I think Naf missed the smoke, like, six rounds in a row. And then Naf's like, it's just a dumb smoke, man. Like someone else <laughs> throw it, and then I think I think I went to throw it, and then I missed it one round, and then a Dren went to throw it, and he missed it. We're like, okay, we're just not smoking window this match. Like, it's not. At least, at least Naf just called it a stupid smoke, bro. <laughs> <laughs> My teammate had me believing the clouds fucking changed, and I was like, dude, that's crazy. <laughs> All right. Well, that has been a good episode. Um, Elise, thank you for coming on. Do you have anything you want to say at the end here to close off? Any Anybody you want to thank? Any family members? Uh, not really. Just thank you for my team, obviously, and all the fans that support me and follow me on Twitter, obviously, at Elise. <laughs> it'll, 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 it'll be on the screen. We got that one. Speaking of which, just in don't case forget, they forgot. Yeah, exactly. Just in case we forgot. So don't forget to follow Peekers Advantage on Twitter. Follow everybody you see on the screen on Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, too, because that helps us a little bit. So um, thank you, everybody. For it doesn't uh, we don't monetize it at all? <laughs> not yet, not yet. So it but it will help. though. It will help. It will help because the higher numbers you have, it'll make a difference. Go to my Twitch page, twitch.tv/sentus, and the PayPal follow, one at the bottom. Donate. Everybody's all so all of their. Ooh, we need a we need a Patreon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Patreon will be there coming soon. Patreon will be coming soon. All right, thanks. Guys. This has been episode ten. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and see you next time.